This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Groomed to Die, the Kenzia Children, the first ever Suffer the Little Children podcast miniseries. I'm your host, Lane, and this is part five, So Many Victims. In the first four episodes of this miniseries, I've talked about Susan Kenzia's adopted baby boys, Michael and Kevin, and their suspicious deaths that led to Susan's murder trial and subsequent acquittal. I've also talked about Susan's alleged medical, psychological, and physical abuse of her second biological daughter, Shannon, now known as Shane. In this episode, I'll tell you about the abuse multiple other children allegedly suffered at Susan's hands, including her older daughter, Christy, her stepsons, John Christopher and Levi, the special needs children she cared for in her in-home daycare center, and her third adopted child, K.L. This is Part 5, So Many Victims. I'd like to take a moment to thank my newest patrons, Beverly Z and Jessica G from Somewhere Out There, Lynn O from Houston, Texas, Melinda D from Francisco, Indiana, and a very special thank you to Diane M from Valdez, Alaska. I appreciate you all so much. I also want to apologize to my patrons that I haven't released any bonus minisodes recently, which are available to patrons pledging $10 or more per month. For that matter, I apologize to all of my listeners for the delay in getting this episode out and for failing to interact with messages and on social media. Between doing everything relating to this podcast myself and spending most of my time doing a lot of extremely tedious freelance writing to make ends meet, I've been struggling to find that mythical work-life balance thing everyone keeps talking about. Thank you for understanding and for being patient with me. Before I jump into the episode, I also want to thank everyone who donated to the GoFundMe I created with Shane and Christy's help. I'm thrilled to report that we've raised enough to buy their baby brother Kevin a headstone. His headstone will be similar in size and shape to Michael's and will take several months to create and install. I'll post updates on Facebook as I get them. Thank you for helping us memorialize Kevin the way he deserves. Now on to part five. I mentioned in the previous episodes that the influence of Susan Lee, formerly known as Susan Stevenson, Susan Cook, and Susan Kenzia, pitted her two biological daughters, Christy and Shannon, against each other for most of their lives. I've also talked at length about Susan's alleged medical abuse of Shannon, who was chronically ill until she finally cut all ties with Susan at age 28. While I did mention that Susan treated Shannon's older sister, Christy, very differently than she did Shannon, What I haven't talked about yet is what Christy went through. Although Shannon thought Christy was treated like the golden child, Christy's experience was anything but idyllic. Christy has very few memories of early life in Virginia, including her baby brothers, Michael and Kevin. In fact, she now has serious memory issues due to decades of trauma and abuse. In recent months, as she's relearned more and more about her childhood, she's remembering more and more details but she believes she may still be suppressing significant memories. Christy told me, My mother is a master manipulator, queen of gaslighting. She will do something and immediately deny it and do it in such a way that you feel you are going crazy. She thrives off of playing people against each other. When she doesn't get her way, she has a tantrum, she lashes out to hurt, and then she will show you and give you the silent treatment. My entire life, my mother has interfered in every relationship I've ever had anything that took attention away from her. I watched her try and destroy anyone who ever tried to walk out of her life. It was terrifying. She always told me that she could disappear someone and that her and her biker people knew where to bury the bodies. Christy was hesitant to participate in putting this miniseries together, in part because she doesn't want to detract from the torment her siblings endured. 
As far as I'm concerned, Christie's story is just as important to hear as the rest of them. Christie's life has been shaped by the actions of her mother, and the fact that Christie is now the fiercely loving mother of three biological children of her own, as well as a stepchild and a foster child, is a testament to her incredible strength and resilience. Of the few memories Christy has of the family's time in Virginia when she was very young, there are a couple that stand out in particular. One involves baby Julie Bates, who I first mentioned in Part 1. Julie was an infant Susan cared for in her home. Her name came up at Susan's trial because while in Susan's care in July of 1985, Julie stopped breathing had to be resuscitated, and was taken to the hospital, where doctors could not determine the reason for her respiratory failure, which never happened again. Christy remembers an incident in which she saw her mother push baby Julie's face underwater. Frightened, she questioned Susan about it, and Susan explained that Julie was holding her breath, so the only way to make her stop was to push her face into the water. If that explanation makes sense to anyone else, please get help. In Virginia, Christy also saw Susan stuff cloth diapers into various babies' mouths, which others, including a teenage foster child and a restaurant employee, also testified to during Susan's trial. After Susan's arrest, Christy and Shannon were sent to live with their grandparents in Rock Hill, South Carolina, where, in short order, they were shuffled over to their Aunt Renee's house. Christy witnessed their cousin, Corey, repeatedly sexually assaulting Shannon. She remembers lying in bed and being told to turn and face the wall whenever Corey came in to assault her sister, and that she was told if she didn't, she would be next. One memory she hasn't quite recovered involves Corey's adopted sister, Rebecca, assaulting her, but she's frustrated that she doesn't remember the details yet. She does remember fragments of an incident when she was in second grade. She was bleeding, but it wasn't her period because she was only seven or eight years old. Her Aunt Renee made Christy lie down on the dining room table, where Renee and another woman examined her genitals. After this, the women discussed Christy's hymen being broken. As a young child, Christy was on vacation with her adoptive father, Tom Kenzia, and his wife, Melinda. Her stepmother found Christy's little notebook in which she had drawn some crude sexual pictures. Instead of raising a red flag about why a young child would draw pictures like that, Melinda and Tom berated and humiliated her about it. For future reference, if you ever discover that a child too young to know about sex is drawing pictures that are sexual in nature, that could be a sign the child has been exposed to something they shouldn't have been or has been sexually assaulted. After Susan was acquitted of Michael's murder and the charge for Kevin's murder was dropped, she moved to South Carolina with her daughters. Before long, Susan and her future husband, John Lee, decided to move in together. Renee and her family moved out of the house where the sexual abuse took place, and Susan and Big John decided to rent the same house, forcing Susan's daughters to live in the place where their literal nightmares were based. Christy did have nightmares after they moved into that house. Even though she was about ten years old at the time, she began wetting the bed every night. Her emotions were so volatile and out of control that Susan took to locking Christy in their vehicle in the driveway and leaving her there for hours to scream herself hoarse inside the car. Christy tried to tell her mother about the sexual abuse that had been occurring on an ongoing basis under their roof after their cousin Corey moved in, but Susan refused to hear it. When Christy threatened Corey with telling someone about what she knew her cousin was doing to her sister, Corey pinned her to the ground and rubbed either poison oak or poison ivy all over her body. At one point, when Christy was in middle school, Renee's daughter Rebecca, who was about Christy's age, lived with her Aunt Susan's family as well. Rebecca threatened to kill herself. With Christy in the car, Susan immediately drove over to the mental hospital, where she dragged Rebecca out of the car, handed Rebecca a knife, and told her to do it. Around 11th grade, Christy told her youth leaders at Lighthouse Pentecostal Church in Fort Mill, South Carolina, that she and her siblings were being abused. Just like what happened when Shannon tried to report their abuse, the adults did nothing. When Christy was a senior in high school, she made the mistake of walking in front of the television, and her stepdad, Big John, threw a remote control at her, leaving a huge bruise on her upper thigh. Christy went down the street and told her third cousin, whose mother, Susan's first cousin, called Susan, and then brought Christy home. A huge fight ensued, during which Susan threw Christy out of the house. 
By that time, that wasn't an uncommon tactic used by Susan, so much so that Christy said she grew up thinking she would be homeless at any moment. Christy obeyed her mother's order to get out of the house. As she was walking down the driveway, she heard a sound behind her and turned to find Susan right there, her face bare inches from Christy's. Susan grabbed her daughter by the neck and dragged her back into the house. Christy forced herself to suppress any emotion or reaction while Susan beat her inside the house, which made Susan so angry she kicked Christy out again. Christy stayed away for a couple of weeks before returning home, and Susan didn't lay her hands on Christy again for a long time. In early 2010, after going through a divorce, Christy moved in with Susan and her terminally ill husband, Big John, to help care for her stepfather, who suffered from pulmonary fibrosis. Christy moved out for about six months when she was pregnant and engaged, but from 2014 until May of this year, Christy, her husband, and their kids lived with Susan in her home. I'll get into more of the events of this year in the next episode. Right now, I'll take a quick sponsor break. On October 24, 1990, John and Susan Lee got permanent custody of John's two sons, 10-year-old John Christopher and 8-year-old Levi, two adorable boys with red hair and freckles. Until mid-1989, the boys had lived with their mom in Alaska, as they had since she and John divorced in 1986. Their mom ultimately moved to California, and in June of 1989, John Christopher and Levi came to live with their father and stepmother in South Carolina. In October of the following year, John and his ex-wife entered into a court agreement in which John obtained permanent custody of both boys and would receive $100 a month in child support. The custody paperwork states that the boys' guardian ad litem or court representative agreed that this arrangement was in their best interest. Curiously, it also said, It is understood and agreed between the parties that currently the children are afraid to visit with their mother. It is not known as to why they are afraid of their mother, but all parties agree that counseling is in order. The children are to attend the Pentis Center in Rock Hill, South Carolina, for counseling. This is to begin as soon as it can be coordinated between the parties and the Pentis Center. The boy's mother, the paperwork stipulated, would be responsible for any expenses incurred during the counseling sessions. The counselors at the center would determine when their mother should attend their sessions and whether or not Big John and Susan would be included in any of the boys' sessions. John Christopher does not remember attending any counseling sessions. Susan later told Shannon that the boys' mother dumped them on her and their father, even though the court documents clearly stated there was an agreement between the parties. At the time, the Lee family lived in a huge house on Woodstock Drive in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and Susan's nephew, Corey, was living there with them. Before long, Susan became abusive toward John Christopher and Levi, in addition to her daughters. She would make up things John Christopher did just to get him in trouble with Big John. She would make little remarks to John Christopher, telling him he was worthless and would never amount to anything. With a wooden spoon, she would beat him from the small of his back all the way down to his ankles, leaving his lower body bleeding in black and blue with bruises, which would be covered up by his clothing. Susan had a penchant for feeding the children mountains of food. If they didn't eat it, she beat them. Whenever Susan demanded that Big John spank his sons, which really meant she wanted him to beat them or hit them with a belt, Big John told them to pretend he beat them. Keep in mind, this was a wild man, a big bad biker who kept knives in his boots and spent time in prison for shooting a police officer, yet he was terrified of his own wife. On occasion, he told his sons that he was planning to take them and leave Susan, but that never happened. Susan seemed to delight in humiliating Levi in particular. When Levi was in sixth grade, he got in trouble for something, and as punishment, for the rest of the school year, Susan forced him to wear the same outfit every day. A black t-shirt, very dark blue stonewashed jeans, and Velcro sneakers she bought from Walmart. Every day when Levi got home from school, Susan forced him to crawl around the yard and pick up dog feces with his bare hands. Levi was very angry with his mother for allowing this to happen, and with his father and Susan for their abuse. Before, he was happy, sweet, and loving, but after moving in with his dad and stepmom, he became a very angry child. For his part, Big John was particularly physically abusive to Shannon and Levi, although John Christopher also took a good amount of his abuse. 
Once, Levi went to school with a black eye caused by his father. All of the kids were dragged out of class that day and talked to. Levi told the truth about what happened, but there was no DSS investigation, and the kids were not removed from the home. Levi grew so fed up with the abuse that once, when he was between 10 and 12 years old, he decided to run away. When Susan went out looking for him, Shannon gave her stepbrother the assist by taking her mother on a wild goose chase to look for him in all the places Shannon knew he wouldn't be. When all of the kids were teenagers, the family computer was set up in Susan and Big John's bedroom. Occasionally, the kids were allowed to use the computer, but they were under strict time limits for each session. Once, John Christopher was on the computer for about five minutes past his time limit. Susan raised so much hell, making such a big deal about it, that Big John snapped and beat his older son senseless with his hands. He ended the assault by hurling the computer itself against John Christopher's chest, so hard the device broke. After moving in with his dad and Susan, John Christopher didn't speak with his mother for eight years until one day when he was a teenager, she called him at work. Because she wasn't allowed to call him at home, she ended up sending him phone cards so they could talk on a payphone. She ultimately sent John Christopher a bus ticket, and as soon as he graduated from high school, he took the bus to visit her. Big John knew about this plan and agreed to keep it a secret, but as soon as Susan found out where John Christopher had gone, she ordered Big John to beat him. As a child and into adolescence, John Christopher suffered from migraines so bad he often threw up. Coincidentally or not, they stopped almost as soon as he moved out of his father and stepmother's house. John Christopher grew up joined the military, and got married in 2007. He and his wife had a daughter in 2017 before ultimately divorcing. During the divorce, John Christopher lived in an RV and had 50-50 custody of his daughter. His brother Levi came to stay with them and provided them with everything they needed. He even planted vegetables in pallet boxes outside the RV. All of Levi's siblings speak of him in glowing terms. They refer to Levi as the comedian of the family, who always tried to lighten things up if the situation got too grim or tense. Sadly, this is a common role assumed by children in abusive or dysfunctional families. It breaks my heart to tell you that in October of 2021, Levi James Lee, just two months before his 40th birthday, passed away. He spent many years in the grip of drug addiction, which his siblings believe was his way of coping with his childhood trauma. Sadly, Levi died from aspiration with fentanyl and methamphetamine in his system, but I firmly believe his death was caused by prolonged child abuse. Levi was laid to rest in California. Julie Bates stopped breathing in Susan's care, but fortunately, she grew up with no ill effects from her brush with death and now has two beautiful children of her own. Julie was far from the only child Susan babysat who suffered injuries, medical problems, and alleged abuse. As I've mentioned, Susan ran an in-home daycare where she cared for multiple children, including many who had special needs. Because she was registered as a daycare but not licensed, she was not supposed to care for more than six kids at once, but she was often over that limit. She usually cared for approximately 22 children at a time with no additional adult help. Some parents paid with state funds, known at the time as ABC vouchers, so to get around the six-child maximum, Susan claimed her daycare had three shifts, with six or fewer kids attending per shift. Shane, who was a teenager at the time, remembers that between November of 1994 and February of 1995, she and Christy were moved out of their room and into the room shared by their stepbrothers, John Christopher and Levi. With all four of them in one bedroom, Susan turned the third bedroom into a repository for babies. Susan filled the entire room with a sea of wall-to-wall pack-and-plays, which also filled every inch of spare space in the bedroom she shared with Big John. Susan apparently had no patience whatsoever for infants, an allegation we've seen plenty of evidence for in the previous episodes. According to Shane, as soon as each baby was dropped off at the daycare in the morning, Susan fixed the baby a bottle, stripped them down, changed their diaper, and gave them Benadryl to knock them out. She would then put them down in one of the pack-and-plays to sleep for the morning, turning on at least two fans in the room for white noise to avoid the other children waking them. She neatly folded the baby's clothes and placed them nearby, leaving them to sleep in just diapers. 
At lunchtime, Susan would wake the babies and feed them lunch before dosing them again with Benadryl and putting them back to sleep for the rest of the afternoon. About an hour before a baby's parent was due to arrive, Susan would wake the baby, dress them, give them a snack, and let them play until their parent came to pick them up. That way, everything seemed normal. One little girl Susan cared for was named Lee, who teenage Shannon nicknamed Bug. Bug started attending in 1993, when she was just two weeks old. After she left the daycare when she was four or five years old, Susan remained a part of her life. They had a great relationship, and they were so close that Susan even attended Bug's high school graduation. Until she spoke with Christy and Shane earlier this year, Bug had no memory of the way Susan treated her when she was little. She suffered a stroke at age 10 that essentially erased all of her memories before the age of 6 or 7. After learning what Susan has allegedly been up to for the past several decades, Bug immediately went no contact with Susan. One incident, as John Christopher recalled it, took place when Bug was about two years old. All of the kids were playing with Duplo blocks, and Susan asked them to clean up because it was time for another activity. Bug, who was just a toddler, was picking up blocks one hand at a time to put them away, and Susan began screaming at her to use both hands. Of course, being so young, Bug didn't have the coordination to clean up as quickly or efficiently as Susan demanded. Susan flew into a rage and began whipping the toddler with a fly swatter, which, it turns out, was one of her favorite tools of abuse. John Christopher remembered the fly swatter specifically. It had a little flip-flop sandal on the end. In fact, according to Shane and Christy, Susan loved that flip-flop fly swatter so much that she had several of them, at least one in each room, and frequently used the thick plastic handles to beat the children in her daycare. The plastic was far from flimsy. It was at least three-quarters of an inch thick. After beating Bug with the fly swatter, Susan threw the baby into the toy box with all the Duplo blocks and closed the lid. She then flipped the box around the living room floor, tumbling Bug and the blocks around inside. When Bug was a little older, she and another girl were staying the night at Susan's house because Bug's mom had to work. Late in the evening, around 10 or 11 p.m., the girls were cleaning up the toys they were playing with, and Bug remembers both Susan and Big John screaming at them to pick up one toy at a time, growing progressively louder and angrier. The girls were tired and wanted to go to bed, but any time they picked up more than one toy at a time, Susan or John would whip them with the flip-flop fly swatter. By that time, they were very good at inflicting temporary welts that faded without leaving bruises. Multiple people have reported seeing Susan force-feed the infants and toddlers in her care. Shane personally witnessed Susan doing so with Bug. If the little girl didn't like what Susan was feeding her, she would try to spit it out. Susan would then force the food back in and cover Bug's nose and mouth until she either swallowed it, choked on it, or passed out from lack of oxygen. I'd be very interested to know if there's any scientific research on a possible correlation between repeated asphyxiation and pediatric stroke. Doctors were stumped as to what caused Bug, who was an otherwise healthy 10-year-old with no family history or hereditary cause, to suffer a stroke. And she wasn't the only one, but I'll get into that shortly. For the record, according to brainandspinalcord.org, strangulation and other manual forms of airway obstruction can cause acquired brain injury, or ABI, such as aneurysm or stroke. Considering Susan's apparent fondness for preventing children from breathing, this looks awfully suspicious, doesn't it? Besides Michael, Kevin, and Bug, a number of other children suffered force feeding at Susan's hands. John Christopher, who was at the time a child himself, remembers watching Susan force feeding a baby named AJ, who threw up in his high chair, but Susan continued to force feed him nonetheless. Shane remembers some babies choking and throwing up when Susan force fed them, and horrifyingly, Susan then forced them to eat their own vomit. One friend of Susan's, a woman named Mara Lee, said that Susan and Big John essentially rescued her and her three kids when she left her abusive first husband, who was a pastor. Her three kids attended Susan's home daycare, and Mara Lee became close with the couple and spent quite a bit of time with Susan and her family. Mara Lee worked at a job that had her out and about most of the time, driving around town, so she stopped in frequently and often stayed for dinner, which meant she witnessed a lot of Susan's interactions with the various children surrounding her. 
Meryl Lee clearly remembers Susan's medicine chest, which was actually a large gray locker secured with a padlock. One weekend, Susan and Big John went away, leaving the kids in Meryl Lee's care. They also left her the key to the medicine cabinet so she could distribute the kids' medication, so she personally saw inside the locker, which was filled with all kinds of different prescription and non-prescription medications. Mara Lee was shocked at the amount of Ipecac syrup Susan had and remembers wondering about it. Although she didn't see Susan actually force-feeding the infants in her care, Mara Lee often noticed Susan becoming aggravated and impatient while feeding them and stepped in to give her a break, feeding, changing, and bathing the babies for Susan, as did Christy and Shannon, who were young but very good with the babies. At one point, the York County Department of Social Services received a report that Mara Lee's son, Benjamin, was being abused or neglected in Susan's care. Mara Lee believes her abusive ex-husband, who at the time was harassing and stalking her, made the complaint. It was ultimately closed as unfounded. One thing Mara Lee did witness was Susan withholding food from her daughters and stepsons. Mara Lee told me, Food shouldn't be a punishment. It was hard to leave them when they were punished to their room and dinner was being enjoyed by everyone else. That's where I came in and snuck food to them. This was very frequently done to the boys, John Christopher and Levi. Susan also withheld food as a punishment from Mara Lee's oldest child, Jay, who was seven at the time. Because Jay wouldn't eat her peas, Susan refused to let her enjoy pizza with everyone else, wanting to leave her both hungry and feeling left out. Even so, Mara Lee allowed her kids to remain in Susan's care. For one thing, her work hours varied so much that no official daycare center would be able to accommodate her. For another, her middle child, Benjamin, had ADHD and developmental delays that made his behavior challenging to deal with, but Susan had experience with such issues. Besides, she loved Susan and her four kids, and she had no idea at the time just how all the puzzle pieces of Susan's life fit together. Marilee's friendship with Susan was short-lived. In 1994, Susan and Big John followed Marilee to a movie theater. They sat near her in the theater and soon approached her to talk about the man she was dating, Stephen, who had never met Susan's approval. Susan tried her hardest to coerce Marilee into breaking up with Stephen, but Marilee refused. Stephen was good to her and her children, and she felt they all deserved him. When Susan realized she couldn't control or manipulate Mara Lee into doing her bidding, she told Mara Lee she had to distance herself and not to contact her again. With that, Mara Lee, who was a guardian angel to Susan and John's children, who snuck them food and snacks and let them come to her house to get away from their parents, was forced to disappear from their lives. I'll pause here for another word from my sponsors. The complaint about Mara Lee's son was not the only DSS investigation Susan faced. On February 25, 1994, Susan received a visit from a caseworker named Tina regarding a report that a little boy at her daycare, who I'll call BG, had been abused or neglected, which triggered an investigation. Two weeks later, the investigation was closed as unfounded. The paperwork notes that Tina spoke with little BG, who had fragile X syndrome, and another boy who attended the daycare both of whom told her Susan did not hit BG. During the investigation, Susan's flagrant disregard for the six-child limit was discovered. On April 1st of the same year, Susan received a letter from Sam Griswold, the director of the South Carolina Department of Social Services. The letter read, Dear Ms. Lee, it has been verified by Mr. Clinton Duncan, Daycare Regulatory Specialist, Region 6 that you are operating a child daycare facility at the above address without a license, approval, or registration. Under South Carolina Child Daycare Licensing Law, no person, corporation, partnership, voluntary association, or other organization may operate a child daycare facility unless licensed, approved, or registered to do so by the Department of Social Services. This letter notifies you that since you are in violation of the law, you must close your child daycare facility until such time as you have completed the appropriate regulatory process. Failure to close your facility upon receipt of this letter will result in penalties provided under the law. Nonetheless, Susan never shut down or licensed her in-home daycare center. Eventually, she and Big John bought the house next door, which her parents owned, and continued operating the daycare from there. 
Another of Susan's friends, Doris McKee, also brought her children to Susan's daycare center. Her son, Brent, reached out to me after I began releasing this miniseries, recounting his memories of Susan as follows. Susan Lee, as I knew her, was a caring and hard-working mother, wife, friend, and daughter. She would talk about the pain of losing her sons, but she would always talk about Michael. I did not even know about Kevin until she mentioned him one day. She would talk about her pain regarding how Shannon's life turned out. She would tell us how Shannon was such a horrible person and turned her back on a mother who cared for her and did so much for her. Susan would talk about how Christy was an ungrateful daughter. When Susan's husband, John Lee, Big John, became sick, I will never forget the times we would rush to Susan's house to be with her as John's condition worsened. Susan always made sure that everyone knew how tired she was or how little sleep she had gotten. Susan would tell us about the nights where John would fight with her and she would blame it on his sickness. He would be out of his mind and even at points he would go a day or two without eating or even waking up. Then, magically, he would get better, but after a week or so he would get worse. I remember one time when I was visiting John and he looked into my eyes and said, Susan is trying to kill me. She put something in my drink. He expressed this several times, but unfortunately, we always thought that he was out of his mind. Unfortunately, he might have been telling the truth. Brent's adoptive brother, Aaron McKee, was about a year older than Brent. Aaron's experiences with Susan will blow your mind. When Aaron was four and a half, he arrived at Susan's daycare one day, seeming perfectly healthy. Within an hour, Susan called his adoptive mother, Doris, in a panic, saying Aaron was having a stroke. Aaron remembers Susan sticking a needle in his neck. He doesn't know what was in it, but he knows he had a stroke not long afterward. That's right, two children Susan cared for suffered strokes, this one in her presence and apparently actively caused by her actions. Aaron was taken to the hospital, where Susan crawled into bed with him, acting frightened. I'm guessing she was far more afraid for herself than she was for Aaron, but that's just speculation. After his stroke, Aaron was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which is part of the autism spectrum. When Aaron was five years old, Shannon was homesick from school when she witnessed yet another example of her mother's truly evil nature. Little B.G., who was around age four by that time, had a potty accident during nap time. When Susan discovered this, she took her trusty fly swatter and savagely beat the disabled boy so hard and for so long that she left bruises and welts all over his arms, legs, and back. You might wonder why she would do such a thing when the abuse would immediately be obvious to B.G.'s father when he came to pick up his son. Susan apparently had a plan for just such an occasion. Heads up, we're entering cartoon supervillain territory. It's terrifying to think that people like this exist and even fly under the radar for as long as this woman has. After beating the daylights out of a little boy with fragile X syndrome, Susan sat down at the kitchen counter with Aaron McKee, who again was about five years old and on the autism spectrum. She proceeded to lecture Aaron about how wrong it was for him to beat BG up the way he did and that he shouldn't have done that. That's right. This 30-something-year-old woman sat there with a straight face and gaslit an autistic little boy into believing he beat up another child and forgot about it. At first, Aaron insisted he didn't do it, but as Susan continued to coerce him, offering him rewards like candy and motorcycle rides, she finally broke Aaron down, leaving him believing he was responsible for Benjamin's bruises and welts. She even forced Aaron to confess to BG's dad when he arrived at the daycare. This incident was the catalyst for a lifetime of hell for Aaron. Although he had always had some behavioral issues, after being blamed for such a violent attack, he began acting out a lot more. It sounds absolutely insane, but Aaron was almost immediately medicated, put on lithium and other heavy-duty prescription drugs at just five years old. Over the subsequent years, Aaron was hospitalized and essentially branded a bad kid, considered crazy, a liar, a troublemaker, and violent. He was given a host of medications he didn't need, all because of Susan Lee's interference in his life. Although the day of the incident was BG's last day attending Susan's daycare, Aaron continued to attend for several years afterward. When he was nine, Susan convinced Doris to send Aaron to William S. Hall Psychiatric Institute, where he was given too much lithium and had to be airlifted to the nearest major hospital. 
He was sent back to William S. Hall twice more before the age of 12, which was when Susan talked Doris into sending him to a military group home for over a year. Around 2007, after Aaron got out of that group home, Susan convinced Doris to give her temporary custody of 14-year-old Aaron, who immediately began losing weight and growing increasingly sick over the next six months. During that time, Doris frequently visited the Lee home. She watched and said nothing when Aaron got home from school every day, and Susan made him go directly to his bedroom, where she made him sit on the floor in the dark and stare at the wall until it was time to go to bed. Only when Aaron began looking noticeably emaciated and sickly did Doris take custody back, and even then, she and Susan remained best friends. Aaron was hospitalized multiple times and placed in multiple group homes and foster homes, where he was beaten, held at gunpoint, pepper sprayed, and robbed, until he was 21. For a while, he was homeless and slept on the street. Aaron has spent almost the entirety of his 20s cleaning up the mess Susan made of his life. I recently had the opportunity to talk to Aaron, and it's my honor to share that conversation with you now. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. I'm really glad you're here to help tell your story, because I know it's been something you weren't necessarily believed about for most of your life. True. Even now, people are just now realizing it. I've been telling the truth all these years. It must mess with your head. Not as much as it used to. I just kind of got used to it over time. I accepted things as they were. I mean, that's all you can do. What was your first memory of being in the daycare or of Susan? At four and a half, being in the daycare, everything's starting out normal. Next thing I know, I have a needle in my neck. And that was the day you had your stroke? Yep. Do you remember anything else from that day? Everything seemed to be normal. Next thing I know, I feel a prick in my neck and then collapsing to the floor, being afraid of what's going on, what's happening to me, being scared of my life for the first time. And the next thing I remember is waking up in a hospital bed. How long did it take you to get out of the hospital? If I remember correctly, like two weeks. After that, I was in physical therapy for years and not able to speak. How did the stroke affect you? So you had trouble? I lost control of my entire right side. Oh, my God. Um, I lost the ability to speak. The entire uh, hemisphere of my brain, had I had to uh, relearn everything. Relearn how to use the bathroom, everything from scratch. How long did it take you to get back to any sort of normal? God, I don't. I didn't have any normalcy until after I got away from them because I was drugged on narcotics against my will. Lithium was only just one of them that happened with the situation. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. What do you remember about that day? Did you witness the attack happen do you, that you remember? No, I was in the kitchen the whole time. I was just in there eating. Next thing I know, Susan's coming around telling me, oh, we don't do that. We don't hit people and started promising me the whole world. And I didn't know better. I was recovering from a stroke. That makes it even worse. She made you confess to BG's dad. Yeah. And how did he react to that? Do you remember? Pissed. I don't remember much else because I got got drugged right after that. And was that when you realized that she was out to hurt you or? I realized it when she stuck a needle in my neck. Is that when you started telling your mom that something was wrong or did you wait for a while? I mean, I couldn't speak properly, so... By the time I could speak, my mom was already convinced I'm a liar, I am crazy, and I'm out my mind, and I'm violent. Yeah, you had no say in it, literally. My entire life, I had no say, so I accepted things as they were, and I kept moving forward, even as a child. Yeah, you you had to. That was really the only way to get through it. So Susan started talking your mom into sending you to hospitals and group homes when you were about, how old did you say? My first say was nine. That's when I got overdosed of lithium. And for the second time in my life, I had to relearn everything. Oh, really? It was actually that bad. Wow. So it was not lithium toxicity. It was a. It was actually an overdose. Yes, an actual overdose. So how many out-of-home placements do you think you had over the years? Three times at William S. Hall, back-to-back. And then uh, Springbrook Travelers Rest, the military group home at 12 for like two years. How was that? It was brutal. I had to endure military training. Oh, my God. I mean, as bad off as I was drugged, and I couldn't do nothing about it, being punished all the time. And then once you got out of there, how did Susan convince your mom to give her temporary custody of you? I don't know. My mom kind of followed her like a dog. Okay. That's the best way I can describe it. Like, everything she says is law, kind of. I mean, it, to me, that whole, the whole friendship scene there seemed kind of off to me. Like she was kind of a, one of the flying monkeys. <laughs> She's following Susan around. Yes. 
How old were you when Doris adopted you? Two days. I was given up at birth to color my flesh. Oh my God, that's terrible. And then you ended up in this household. And how many kids were there all together? I had three older siblings, Todd, then Sam, then Tara, then me, then Brent, then Sienna. Brent and Sienna were adopted after me. And were you the only one who had quote unquote behavioral issues? <sighs> yes, I was quote, the bad, evil child. So she kind of handed you over to Susan to deal with. And I kind of want to get into that a little bit. When you moved in with Susan, so you had a bedroom. Yep. And you had said that she sent you into your room as soon as you got home from school every day. And you couldn't leave the room until bedtime. Actually, not even then. I can't even come out to go pee without because <sighs> she put an alarm on my door. I was basically forced to pee in the room like an animal. You said that when you were 14, you sent me that one picture of yourself where you were very thin and you said Susan had withheld food. She didn't withheld food. No, it was poison. What happened there? What was, what was the story with that? I was eating just fine. The poison was in the food. I ate every day. And what do you think she was trying to accomplish with that just to make you sicker? Yep. Kind of like her daughter. Just like she had it. I mean, Shane, excuse me. Did you know at the time or did you suspect that Susan was behind making Shane sick? Yes. Just like I suspected that, you know, I don't know if they talked about Big John and Susan's relationship with him. <laughs> yep. I did go into that a little bit. I looked up to that man. He told a lot of people that she was trying to poison him. I know she told your brother or he told your brother, I should say. He told Shane. Wow. I didn't even know about my brother. Yeah, he, he said that John told him personally, she's trying to poison me. So it's more than one person John told. And then, and then his so-called miraculous decline, that's what kind of hit me. How long do you think your mom knew about the way Susan was treating you? Or what do you think she knew? I mean, she would have never pulled me out and taken that picture if she didn't get a clue. She just chose to be the loyal dog and play ignorant. So that was when she, she realized something was going on. I mean, she wouldn't have pulled me out, but you know who she still followed around? dismissing her own son what was her rationalization for that it was so embedded in her head that i'm such a villain that nothing i ever say was ever true and i was at carolina children's home which i told you about where i spent two and a half years straight being beaten every single day the kids and the staff i was left bloody every day blood coming out of my mouth bruises all over my body and my mom susan Dad, everybody telling me it's all my fault. I'm just being mocked as I'm being beaten. My case regret at the time was Tamika Ratchford. She was an evil woman. She says, you deserve what you're getting. This took place when I was 16. From there, I went to a boy's home where I got my GED, right? And then I ended up in the foster care system from 2013 till 2014, about August. So you're doing better now? You're you're happy where you are? Oh, yeah. Good. That's awesome. I'm so glad. I mean, after all this time of not being believed and not being able to advocate for yourself, and now you're telling your story and you're taking care of yourself and you cut off contact with the people who caused the problems. Yep. Sometimes in life, you got to do what you have to do. Whether you like it or not, it's the best for the situation. You know, this is the kind of thing that if there wasn't already so much information and so much evidence that Susan is a terrible person, it'd be hard to believe it. Yeah. It just sucks that you had to go through it your whole life telling people what's going on and being told you're crazy. You've got to start questioning your own sanity at some point. Yeah. I'm glad you're doing better. And what do you think comes next? What do you plan to do? Just live life and be happy for once in my life and not be weighed down with baggage anymore. It's a relief. At 26, I even had a minor heart attack. And all of these medical problems, do you think they all kind of stemmed from the stroke at four and a half? That and stress and all the drugs, the poisoning. So basically, if Susan had never come into your life, you might not have any of those issues. But yeah, I'd be a healthy man. I would have had a normal life. It says a lot about how much child abuse can affect you for your entire life. You deserve to live your life and be happy and, and not have that baggage anymore. You know, just live your truth. And thank you for letting me help you tell your story. You know what? I'm the one who's grateful that my voice is just being heard. Huge thanks to Aaron for telling us about everything he endured. His bravery, perseverance, and strength is an inspiration, and I'm honored to help amplify his voice.
Like I told Aaron, he, Shane, and all of Susan's other victims deserve to be heard and believed. Now I'll take a moment for one last sponsor break. As you probably remember, several people suspect Susan was involved in either causing the death of her husband, Big John Lee, or at the very least, making him sicker than he had to be. You might be interested to know that John was not the only adult in Susan's direct sphere of influence to die an untimely death. In early 2012, an incident occurred involving Susan and a sick friend. This may or may not be pertinent, but in light of everything else we've learned about Susan's life, it's certainly worth mentioning. Prior to this incident, Susan and her friend, Caroline Hauser, had had some kind of a falling out, which was totally not out of the norm for Susan, who has reportedly always thrived on drama. Susan and Caroline started talking again very shortly before this incident took place. The following information came from a witness statement Susan made to the York County Coroner's Office on April 2, 2012. On Friday, March 30, 2012, Susan picked up her friend, Caroline Hauser, from Piedmont Medical Center in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Caroline was just released from inpatient mental health care, and Susan went over Caroline's medications and discharge instructions with a nurse, noting that she asked the nurse if Caroline was ready to be released, and the nurse said she was. Susan and Caroline stopped off at a doctor's office to pick up some samples of Abilify, and also stopped at the pharmacy to pick up three more prescriptions. Susan said Caroline was having trouble walking and holding on to Susan's arm. She wrote, She missed the step and fell on the concrete, scratching her knees, forearms, and left palm that I saw. After that, the two went to the shrimp boat, where Susan said, We talked and cut up. She said something about getting something from the pawn shop next door, but that we could do that tomorrow. Susan took Caroline home, where she asked Caroline if she would come home and stay with her and John until her husband, Don, got back into town but Caroline refused, saying she would be fine, she was just adjusting to her new meds, and was not feeling well due to her MS. Susan wrote that Caroline called her later in the afternoon, saying the pharmacy gave her the wrong meds. The pills were pink, and she took two of them, but the pharmacy was delivering the right ones and she would just rest on the couch. The next morning was Saturday, March 31, 2012. Susan said Caroline called her at 7.37 a.m. and didn't sound good. So Susan went over and found Caroline up and walking around. Caroline said she would just rest that day on the couch. Susan told her to call her when she woke up. Around dinner time, Susan said, she called Caroline, who hadn't called. She sounded sleepy and hard to understand, but said she had eaten. She wrote, I asked if I could get her and bring her to the house. She said no, she was just going to rest on the couch. I told her to call me no matter what time. She said she would told each other we love each other, would see her tomorrow. The next day, which was Sunday, April 1st, Susan got a call at 2.50 p.m. from Caroline's husband, Don, asking if she had heard from her. Susan said she hadn't, but would be going over later. She left a message for Caroline at 3.15 and went to her house around 4.45, where she went in through the unlocked back door and found Caroline lying unresponsive on the couch, with white, frothy stuff coming out of her nose and mouth. Susan called 911 and waited outside for the ambulance, advising a neighbor against performing CPR, since it was obvious she didn't just stop breathing, meaning Caroline had been dead for some time. I'm not insinuating that Susan had anything to do with Caroline's death. I just felt it was interesting and coincidental enough to bear mentioning, especially since Caroline had just gotten out of the hospital and her death was evidently related to medication she was taking that Susan helped her pick up. By 2011, Susan had become friendly with a pregnant woman named Tina, who already had two children who weren't in her custody. Tina told Susan she didn't want the baby and was considering an abortion. Somehow, Susan talked Tina into keeping the baby and assured her she would be there if Tina needed help. When the baby, who I'll call K.L., was about six weeks old, Tina was arrested and called Susan to come get the baby because no one in her family would take her. Susan rushed out of the house with no explanation. At the time, Christy and her son were living there to help take care of John, who was still on home hospice care. 
Susan came home a short time later with the baby, handed her to Christy, and told her to bathe her, because Susan was running out to grab everything she would need. It was December, and the baby was wearing just a onesie, not even socks. She smelled so strongly of smoke that Christy had to give her three baths to rid her of the smell. After Tina was released from jail, she took baby K.L. back. Susan continued to offer her support and assistance whenever she needed it. When K.L. was three months old, Tina called and asked Susan if she could watch the baby while Tina went to the lake. Tina never returned for her baby. At that point, DSS got involved and put a safety plan in place, but Tina did not abide by it. In fact, she only visited the baby twice over the next two years. DSS pushed for Tina's rights to be terminated and essentially pushed Susan into adopting K.L., even though Susan claimed she didn't want to be a mom because of her age. By then, she was in her early 50s. Nonetheless, Susan took the baby in for quite some time encouraging her to call Christy Mama. I know I can't be the only one absolutely stunned that DSS apparently didn't look into Susan's history at all. I have to wonder if they still would have pushed for Susan to adopt K.L. if they knew the last two babies she adopted ended up dead less than a year apart, each within two months of adoption. In early 2013, Susan's legal adoption of her former friend Tina's three-year-old, K.L., was finalized. After John died in May of that year, Christy told Susan she wanted to move out, which she had been wanting to do for some time. Even though for two years Susan had encouraged K.L. to call Christy mom, Susan told her that if she left, she couldn't take K.L. with her and that the baby would now call Susan mama instead of Christy. After Christy moved out in December of 2013, while she was living elsewhere and had another baby of her own, she began to suspect something was wrong in her mother's home. She could see it in her baby sister's eyes that something was wrong, and when Susan hacked off all of K.L.'s long blonde hair, Christy suspected her sister was being abused. Her suspicions soon solidified into certainty. Christy personally witnessed Susan putting the little girl into cold showers as punishment. At the time, Susan had a dog, a mini pincher, who was incredibly mean. Christy hated that dog. He had attacked her in the past, and he also bit one of her sons, resulting in stitches in his eyebrow. The hospital refused to report the dog attack, however, and Susan had no intention of getting rid of him. Instead, she made the dog attack K.L. for her own amusement. As you can see, we're still in cartoon supervillain territory. Despite Christy and her best friend making abuse reports to DSS, nothing was done to remove K.L. from Susan's care. Finally, in June of 2014, Christy voluntarily moved herself and her sons back into Susan's home so she could protect her little sister because no one else seemed willing to. Unfortunately, that was nowhere near the end of K.L.'s suffering at her adoptive mother's hands. I can promise you we're going to get into a lot more about K.L.'s hellish experiences with Susan in the next episode. In Part 6, I'll also tell you about how Susan's carefully constructed house of cards finally began to collapse and how her many victims reclaimed their voices. My sources for this episode were Court Documents, BrainAndSpinalCore.org, SCChildCare.org, and Personal Accounts. That's it for this episode. Join me next time for Part 6. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com. To help support the show, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod or ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit ChildHelp.org 
or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something.